Our first reading from this morning is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And the second reading is from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. So look at Apollos and me as mere servants of Christ, who have been put in charge of explaining God's mysteries. Now a person who is put in charge as a manager must be faithful. May God add his blessing to the reading of these words. So the sermon this morning is part of uh, uh, basically an introduction to the theme that we'll be covering over the next few weeks. Today begins our stewardship campaign. I trust that if you are on our email list, you got the links to the daily devotional and uh, to the money autobiography. It's also on our church website, uh, available to you on the resources page and also on the sliding picture thingy. Uh, the one that says uh, think greater. Uh, with, the, you, yeah, with that logo right there, if you click on it, it will take you to the resource page and it will uh, it'll, it'll enable you to download the devotional, which uh, hopefully you can all read together and, and help us to think and meditate what it means to be uh, stewards of, of the gift and the grace of Jesus Christ and what it means to think greater. Now, the think greater theme is based on John 14, where Jesus is with his disciples, and his disciples are kind of getting tired of hearing Jesus talk about the Father. They want to see the Father. And, 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 and they begin to second-guess him. And Philip, uh, on, on, on that occasion, says, let us see the Father. You know, you're talking so much about the Father. The Father this, the Father that, the Father knew you, you and the Father, all these good things. Show us the Father. Show us the Father. Show us God. And Jesus is sort of heartbroken. Because the disciples have been with him all this time. And, 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 and he tells them, haven't you seen and heard and experienced this for enough with me to know that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And Jesus tells them this. Believe me when I say I'm in the Father. Or at the very least, believe on the evidence of the works themselves. And then he gives them a promise. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will, and, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now that's a pretty heavy duty promise there. I don't know about you, but... Well, but let's take a survey. Has anyone done, performed any miracles this week? <laughs> any of the miracles of Jesus, has anybody performed them this week? No, we're not there quite yet. 
<laughs> Maybe not quite the way it's in Scripture. But the thing is, is that this is Jesus' promise to us. This is, this, is, this is what he's giving us as his disciples. He commands us to do greater works than what he has done. Now, that's what we're going to be exploring over the next few weeks. That's what we want to engage in. But let's go into today's text. You know, Jesus is always looking for disciples. He's always, uh, you know, in, in most of Jesus' encounters, more than uh, moving people to make a decision to believe in him, although in our text, uh, in, in the John text that I just shared with you, he is saying, if you believe in me, you'll get all these rewards. But even more than that, Jesus, Jesus often seeks for people to make a choice to become one of his disciples. To become a follower of Jesus. A disciple is a student, a learner, a follower. Uh, it's someone who ascends not only intellectually saying, oh yeah, I acknowledge him as, as Lord. But also who begins to apply and to teach to others. So there's this whole idea of receiving, but also of giving. <clears throat> to apply to teach to others what they have seen and heard and learned from their teacher. And in our case, Christ Jesus is our teacher. He's the one who leads us. He's the one who guides us. And so our scripture today deals with Jesus' disciple-making efforts. Matthew 5 is part of a larger conversation, a conversation that we call the, the Sermon on the Mount. And here we listen to Jesus' beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We hear his declarations that his disciples are the salt of the earth and the light of this world. He takes the commandments to a whole other level, moving them beyond uh, just the evil actions, just acknowledging the evil actions that people do. But he reveals the deeper evil that can lurk in people's hearts. And so that's where you hear him say, you've heard. You've heard it said, do not commit murder. But if you hate in your heart, you're already guilty of it. And all this is so that no one would rely solely on how good of a person they are. But instead, they do it all, acknowledge, and learn to rely on God's great and generous love for us. That's what Jesus is sharing with his disciples. And in our text this morning, Jesus is, 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 is trying to bring in the disciples. And, and, and you know, he, he's, he's forming them and molding them to be the, the people that he wants them to be. And, and, and he gives them these strange commands. This, this way of being, and, and, you know, this is not to, our scripture reading is not to be taken literally. You know, he's not literally saying that people just take advantage of you. Let, let, you know, don't call, let, don't, you know, let, let people smack you around like I was saying, sharing with the children. But he's, 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 in, he's imposing upon them an attitude, a way of being, a way of thinking. Now, I think that we would all gladly walk with someone we like an extra mile. We would all, uh, uh, you know, gladly go with, as far as they need to go with somebody we appreciate and we believe in. But in our scripture reading, when Jesus says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. You know, Jesus is talking about their reality, what things that happen in their day. Walking the extra mile that Jesus was talking about, he is, he's talking about coercion. In this time, you know, you, get the, you would get the Roman soldiers who might be going from one town to the next. And they would get tired of carrying their bags, and they might just find a regular civilian. They might say, hey, you, come here, carry my stuff, let's go. And you were forced to carry their stuff. I, we, we see that, for example, even in when Jesus is being crucified. And then Jesus gets to the point when he's going up to Golgotha, that he can't handle the cross anymore. He falls down. And what do, what do the Roman soldiers do? They pick the first guy in the cross. They say, you, come here, pick up his cross. And he carries his cross for Jesus. But what is Jesus saying? Jesus, you know, and in this time the, the possibility of, of being coerced was to carry somebody else's burden was very real. 
But Jesus is saying, even if you're compelled by force to do something for someone, you can demonstrate freedom by volunteering more than was demanded. By being gracious. You know, that, that's what we get when, 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 when Paul and Silas, they're in jail, and, and they begin to sing, and the jail begins to shake, and the doors are all open, and the jailer, you know, he was about to kill himself because it was going to cost him his life and his family's life for all the jailers, for, for all the prisoners that left. But Paul stops and says, wait, we're all still here. We haven't gone anywhere. And then the man is baptized because of Paul's generosity, because, because of the grace that God has given Paul. To be confident that even though he may be in chains in life, in spirit, and in his heart, and in his mind, he's not, he's not changing and so Jesus is teaching, are, are, are giving us this, this kingdom ethic, this ethic for, for resurrection people, as I've, as I've been sharing with you the last few weeks. You know, it, it, it's this ethic to convict the lost and to motivate the saved. It's this ethic to, to, to not only show how the lost can be saved or how you can come into relationship with Christ, but it also has to do with what the expectations are for those who are in Christ. So Jesus is preaching an attitude, a way of being, a way of living, a way of, of managing life. And that's what a steward is. It's a manager. It's somebody who manages life, but for the glory of God. No longer, I mean, the victory is always yours, but the glory is always God's. That's what, that's what a steward was, you know, in, in the... Uh, in, in, in the New Testament, the word for stewards is oikonos, which sounds like economy, right? But oikos means house. And so it's somebody who manages the house. It's somebody who's working in the house, who's, who's, who's serving. And, 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 and different stewards, they, or the stewards, they, they have different jobs. Uh, some of them dealt with the finances of the home. Some of them dealt with the cattle or the children. Some of them even raised the children. In, in, in the Bible, for example, we have the example of Abraham's son uh, who needed a wife. And what did Abraham do? He told his servant, go, go find a wife <laughs> for my son. Now, those of us who have children, when was the last time that you sent somebody else to find a wife? <laughs> or a husband, a spouse? <laughs> Your children. <laughs> that just doesn't happen, but that's that was the job of the steward, of the manager. And over time, we, we, we see how from its beginnings, from being someone who managed the household, to coming into the time of Jesus, where the steward now was, it was, it was, it was a position to change. It was somebody who managed the kingdom of God. Somebody who ushered in the, the, the glory of God. Somebody who, as Paul said and we read, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, chapter 1, or time chapter 4, as we heard, it, somebody who manages the mysteries of Christ. What is that? What are the mysteries of Christ? Can somebody share with me what the mysteries of Christ are? What do you think they are? The table is open. What are the mysteries of Christ? What do you think they are? You experience them every day. Is it a mystery? <laughs> it sounds hard, right? But think about the love of God in your life. Is it not this mysterious thing that out of all the things created, God has decided to reside in your heart. Think about the incarnation. Almighty God, no need, of, completely self-sufficient. Well, he couldn't live without us. He came and took on our humanity. Is that not a mystery? Think about the triune God revealed. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit revealed to us. God could be, you know, and I have to say this. God could be so much more than the Trinity. Okay? We cannot limit God, our, our understanding of God. God could be so much more than that. 
But how has God decided to reveal himself to us? As community. As the God who lives within himself in community. What does that mean for us? What is the expectation for us? These are all mysteries. Think of the church. Why didn't God just write in the heavens with his finger of fire and say, Hey, you know, I am God. You are to serve me. And then, <laughs> you know, and just preach the gospel that way. Instead, he sends us, you and me, flawed people to represent a holy God. To be God's people. To be stewards of the mysteries of God's grace. Think of the healing that each one of us gives uh, uh, to each other as we stand together, as we pray together. We're here today because of those who have passed on before us, because of their prayers, because of their work. As they thought about this ministry, people like Alice Hornicle, who prayerfully gave her services and, and her gifts and her graces to this church, and thought about us, even some of us who weren't here at the time, in order to be able to share the mysteries of God's grace. And so, as stewards, that's what we do. That's what we're called to do. And 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 Jesus is saying, you know, that as as that as stewards of God's kingdom, of God's mysteries, as as those who have been called to live to a higher ethic. We are people who go the extra mile. We are people who do that. Not because our neighbor deserves it, but we do that for our love of Christ. Now what would it be if everyone moved from doing the minimum to going just one extra mile, a little bit further? Indeed, God calls us to do more, to be more, to serve more. God calls us to give more. And you might be feeling guilty right now because you might be saying, oh, well, you know, I don't give. I haven't done anything and I don't have time. And, you know, my schedules are tight and life is hard. And, and, and I'm not trying to give you a guilt trip. Instead, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I, I, I want to I illuminate this in a much more positive way. Because I don't think that God wants us to operate under the chains of guilt. I think that God wants us to operate and be stewards of his mysteries, to be his disciples, to be those who, who teach and those who, who, who promote and those who share the love of God. Out of love. So... What good could we do if we were to set the love of God and the grace of God in our hearts free from the constraints of our anxieties, from our own feelings of inadequacy? What impact for good could we make if we were to set the love of God free from our own inhibitions, if we were just to let it go? And step out boldly in faith and be God's people. What would our community be like? What would our church be like? What would our own lives be like? What would it be like if God's people were bolder about the way they express their love toward one another and toward new people in their midst? You know, I, I remember I, I remember walking into this one church, and this was <laughs> this this was a strange and heartwarming experience at the same time for me. And there was this this uh this lady, you know, one of those uh, church ladies that have been there for a long time. And she was a hugger. You know what kind of people those are? She, she was a hugger. She liked to hug you and hug you tight. And it was my first time in the church and I was a little bit nervous and it was different and it was new. And, and you know, the, the time for greeting came and she grabbed my hand. She was like, oh no, baby, come here. <laughs> Let me show you the love of Jesus. <laughs> she just about choked me to death. <laughs> Imagine how my heart felt, how welcome, how open I felt, how, how wonderful I felt because of the way she welcomed me. God wants us all to do the same thing. 
What if we walk the extra mile with each other in gratitude for what Jesus has done in our lives? How would that change? Instead of out of obligation, instead of out of guilt, instead of out of duty, to do it out of gratitude. The other day I was reading a devotion, and I'm going to close with this. And it, it, it touched my heart in such a profound way. I, I, I was just really moved. Because I thought to myself, that's where it's at. That's where God's people are called to, to, to do and to be. And so I'm, I'm reading this, this devotion. It's the story of this lady named Joy, Joy de Coke. And, and she, she shares her story about becoming a writer. Now, she felt called to write. She had the gifts to write. But she didn't have the courage to step out into that field. And she couldn't leave her job to pursue this, this dream because things at home were tight. But this is her story. She says, one evening, my husband John came home from work, and after kissing me hello, he handed me two magazines for writers. And he said, Joy, please quit your job and follow your dream and write. She describes this argument that she got into with him. She said, I can't write because of 10,000 reasons. And then she says, the next day, I was off from work. And as I was cleaning the house, the doorbell rang. A delivery man stood on the porch with a new desk and my first word processor. Now, you know this goes back a little bit, right? <laughs> we don't have word processors anymore, I think. She says, things for us were tight financially, but John still found a way to put his words into action. To honor his generosity, the first document I typed was my resignation. I called John to thank him, and he said, I'm praying for you. Those powerful words felt like warm oil poured over my wounded heart. Comfort and encouragement evicted out doubt and despair. When I said yes to writing, I didn't do it because I believed in it. I did it because John believed when I could not. And this is what the church is called to do. This woman is now a best-selling author. She's got a ton of devotional books that are just all full of all sorts of encouragement. But this is, that's her beginning. What if we were to pour our lives into the lives of others? Intentionally, freely, without fear, believing when others cannot believe. This is the power the church has through the Holy Spirit every time it opens up its hand to live enthusiastically, to give wholeheartedly, to love unconditionally, and to bring others into that life. This is God's calling to all of us as stewards of the mysteries of His grace. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for you have given us this wonderful charge and sometimes, truthfully, Lord, we're, we're, we're a bit overwhelmed. We don't know what to do with it always. But Lord, we pray make us sensitive to your voice, sensitive to your leading, sensitive to your spirit that we might be led to the waters where we can drink and serve others and lead others, Lord God, also to drink from that well that never goes dry. Lord, we are your people. And we want to live and give and love and be those people who do that beyond people's other expectations. Who do that out of the grace and the love and the goodness that we have experienced in you. We want to be those who make an impact for good. And those who are not tied down by our anxieties and our nerves and, and our feelings of inadequacy. So Lord, I pray, provide us opportunities this very week. Provide us opportunities to be your people, to step forth in faith. Give us the courage and the strength to go forward so that in all things you might be glorified. So that in all things, Lord God, your name might be lifted up. Amen.